Hello and welcome to a new episode of A Flatpack History of Sweden, the podcast that takes you chronologically through Swedish history from when the first humans arrived here up until the modern day. I am Chris. And I'm Elsa, but today we should perhaps say Moi ja tervetuloa podcastin A Flatpack History of Sweden, vaikka tänen puhemekin Suomesta. Seuraavan kuudensan vuoden ajan teemme kaunis, mä Pohjalahden itsepuolella tulee olemaan itä Ruotsin kanssa. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, this isn't the Swedish phrase of the week, that's more like the Finnish paragraph of the week. So what does that mean? Yeah, that was indeed Finnish. And what I was trying to say was, hello and welcome to a flat pack history of Sweden. Even though today we are going to talk about Finland, the beautiful land east of the Bay of Bothnia that will now be intertwined with Sweden for the next 600 years. Well, yes, uh, I guess not too many of our listeners would understand what it meant when you were saying it. And um, perhaps your accent maybe needs a bit of work. <laughs> mm. I have no idea. Maybe. <laughs> well, uh, you're right. Uh, I don't speak a word of Finnish. Uh, but a huge thanks to my Finnish friend, Mary, who helped me with the translation and the pronunciation of that bit. We are going to spend the entire episode today talking about Finland because our dear neighbors on the other side of the Bay of Bothnia are instrumental to our history, as we'll see. Uh, but before we get to that, we should probably do a real Swedish phrase of the week. And uh, it's fitting that it actually isn't even Swedish. It is actually Finnish, so it's more like another Finnish phrase of the week. It's a very Swedish phrase phrase in Finnish, I think. Uh, do you want to have a go at pronouncing it this time? Yes, it's a sapeta. Yes, uh, a quite weird phrase because it's not actually a phrase or an idiom or a proverb as such. It simply means do not cover. It has developed into a bit of a joke between Swedes and Finns because uh, while Danish, Norwegian and Swedish are quite similar languages and are often mutually intelligible, Finnish is completely different and not something that we Swedes are able to pick up and decipher as such without actually studying it and learning it. Uh, but there is one phrase that almost all Swedes can say in Finnish, and that is Eisapete, do not cover. Because it used to be written on all the radiators in our bathrooms and the heaters in saunas, uh, as in, do not cover this, there is a risk of fire sort of thing. Uh, and I guess in the days before smartphones, you didn't have anything else to read in the bathroom. So you read the back of shampoo bottles and you read the stickers on the radiators and so on to keep you entertained. Um, so we all learned this phrase, a sapete. Which perhaps isn't the most practical phrase to know uh, nowadays, though. Um, you can't really weave it into a conversation very smoothly unless you're standing somewhere and have to shout it out to a Finnish child who's doing something wrong. No, that's true. Uh, perhaps because it is so useless as a random phrase, but still so many Swedes know it, it has developed into a bit of a joke. Uh, the Finns have sort of thrown it back in our face as a funny example of how ignorant or perhaps downright stupid Swedes are, that all that we can say when we come to Finland is do not cover, uh, especially since many Finns speak Swedish fluently, either because it's actually their first language or because they learned it in school. Uh, in fact, all Finns must study Swedish in elementary school, the reason for which we will start to cover in this episode. So it seems like a very uneven relationship in terms of language understanding. Finns actually learning Swedish at school, but all the Swedes can say is do not cover. Yeah, very unequal, very unfair. I guess a lot of that is summarized in that one random phrase. And I know in recent years there's been a book written uh, about Finns living in Sweden and their experience, and that's called A Sapete. And there was a TV show, I believe, also called A Sapete, that was a sort of talk show that had both Swedish and Finnish guests. So, in a way, it seems to have become a 
jokey byword for Swedish-Finnish relations. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, the beginning of these Swedo-Finnish relations. For about six to eight hundred years, it depends a little on when you start counting from, as we'll discover later in the episode, Sweden and Finland were one country. In some ways, we can say that this begins now, in the 1200s, and lasts all the way up until 1809. During this period, Finland was not an independent country like it is today, but rather it was a part of Sweden. It was an ingrained and integrated part of Sweden, and that's very important to remember as we move along with our journey. Everything that happens in Swedish history is as much about that land that we now call Finland as it is about Sweden that remains today. Indeed it is. Uh, until we get to 1809, which, let's face it, is a really long way into the future, when you picture the map of Sweden in your head, don't think of what the country looks like today, but instead, from now on, imagine a country that's sort of like a horseshoe shape around the Bay of Bothnia, that north bit of the Baltic Sea. You've got Stockholm on one side to the west, and you've got Åbo, which is today Finland's second biggest city, on the other side, and sort of in the middle, in the sea, are the Åland Islands. That's the heartland of Sweden now, and remains so for the next several hundred years in terms of our narrative in the podcast. The top bit of the horseshoe doesn't become Swedish for a while yet, it's fairly unexplored, but both ends of it are now very much a part of the story. This kind of discussion might sound a bit colonialist or imperialist, especially if you're more familiar with histories of other countries and independent movements and struggles of places such as Ireland, Algeria or the Baltic states. Uh, to suggest that all Irish history before the 1920s is British history, well that's inflammatory at best and basically plain wrong. Uh, similarly, not all Finnish history is Swedish history, but for six to eight hundred years a large chunk of this history is shared, and it was as one entity that the Swedish monarchs ruled over one country that encompasses both modern-day Sweden and Finland. The map of Sweden looks quite different at this point. In fact, you can see it on our website where we have a map of Swedish territory in the year 1266 when Bjarl died in a couple of episodes ago. As we mentioned quite a few times, the southern part of what is Sweden today, that bit that will make the country stretch all the way down and have a south-facing coast and a west coast, that's not Sweden yet. So that's still Danish or Norwegian at this time and will be for quite a few hundred more years to go. Yeah, if you count from now, the year 2021, Finland had been part of Sweden for about 440 years longer than the area where I'm from has been up until now. I'm, I'm from that part of southern Sweden. Uh, even though, of course, where I'm from is Sweden right now and Finland is an independent country now. Let's round the figures a bit and say for simplicity's sake that modern-day Finland was a part of Sweden for 800 years. Skåne, the southernmost county of modern-day Sweden, where I'm from, became Swedish in 1658, meaning that we have been part of Sweden for only 363 years by now. Yeah, so you've got nothing on Finland. You're definitely still the newcomers. Uh, come back in about 500 years and then yeah. you, can, you can beat them then. And this is very interesting when you put things into perspective like this. State borders are, of course, far from fixed, nor are they there by any natural order. They're imposed and become part of our lives due to political reasons. But if we look at the historical perspective, we can see how much has changed and how areas have been united and separated over time, and thus consequently share a common history for longer or perhaps shorter periods of time than you once thought. Indeed, and because Sweden and Finland share such a long period of history as one entity, we cannot really go any further on our chronological journey without stopping to properly talk about Finland and look at how we became one state 
uh, which we've hinted at in many previous episodes. As we all know, history is not something that's just dead in the past, uh, even if it is literally <laughs> in the past, in the sense that it's the study of what's happened, but it isn't a fixed thing that has no effect or relevance for the present day. On the contrary, our history and how we relate to it is something that is very much going on right now and changing. This can be seen quite clearly in how Sweden and Finland's shared history is viewed today and how it is retold in both those countries. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I must confess that as I was writing this episode, this was very much on the top of my mind and I was weighing each word very carefully in some cases trying to be very conscious of the meaning of words and how some words like colonization, independence and occupation are very charged and can stir up very emotional imagery. Now, neither Chris nor I are Finnish. Our family background and our own personal background is in Sweden or in England. We have been to Finland. Uh, I have even worked for a short period of time in Finland. And we have several Finnish friends who are very dear to us, but we have not lived the Finnish experience. In particular, we have not lived the experience or through our families lived the experience of Finnish independence from Russia in 1917, the subsequent Finnish civil war, the two wars involving Finland that took place during the Second World War, nor anything else that have shaped the modern state of Finland. We are also not living in Finland right now, and consequently we're not directly affected by contemporary debates about the status of the Swedish language, or the debate around how history is taught in Finnish schools. What I guess I'm trying to say in a hopefully not too convoluted way is that we appreciate that there are many different ways to view and to analyze our shared Swedish-Finnish history and that how you view history has an impact on the opinions you form about the state of things today. I don't want to say that there are no right or wrongs here, because that's also not true, but just to say that we are aware of differences in views and opinions, not just among historians, but also among politicians and the general population in Finland when it comes to Finland's history as part of Sweden. Yes, and as always, we've tried to base this episode on a range of sources and on the works of different historians to bring you as nuanced a retelling as possible. We should give a particular shout out to Henrik Meinander, the professor of Swedish-speaking history at the University of Helsinki. One result of this shared history is that Swedish and Finnish are both official languages in modern-day Finland, and institutions from universities to the tax office provide services in both languages. Professor Meinander is the professor of the history at Helsinki University that is taught in Swedish. His book, Finland's Historia, also available in English with the nice and easy title, A History of Finland, provided a very good and very accessible overview when we started the research for this episode. And one last thing before we move on, speaking of how we are extra conscious of the words we use in this episode, like Wasser said earlier, we did discuss what we're going to call the towns and places in Finland when they come up. Because of these two official languages, sometimes there are two different names for a place or town depending on which language you're using. For example, the city of Orbu that Orsa mentioned earlier, Orbu is called Turku in Finnish, and that's also the name that's used in English, for example if you fly there, or if you scroll over and have a look at it on Google Maps. In the end, we've decided to go with using the Swedish names for the places in Finland, because that's what we're doing for places and people in Sweden. We don't use the English names, for example, Jettebor for Gothenburg or Karl for the kings that are sometimes called Charles in English. If something's more known in the English-speaking world by its Finnish name rather than its Swedish name, we'll definitely mention that first so you know what we're talking about, but then continue to use the Swedish names going forward. Now, that being said, shall we begin with our little retelling of early Finnish history? Yes, we definitely should. Now, on our journey through Swedish history, we are up to the mid-1200s or thereabouts, so we will rewind from there uh, in terms of what has been going on in Finland. 
And in terms of where we are geographically, we're in the eastern part of the Baltic Sea, in that bit of land on the top right uh, that is the modern day country of Finland. Uh, but what had been going on there up until now? Uh, it didn't just magically appear right about now. What was there in Finland before it became integrated with Sweden? Well, in the beginning, there was ice. And then there was some more ice. And then there was even more ice. <laughs> but to be fair, that wasn't just the case in Finland. That's true of pretty much everywhere in Northern Europe at this point. True. Just like in Sweden, Finland was covered by ice for a very long time during the latest ice age. In fact, the geography of Finland is a product of this latest ice age and what happened when the ice melted. Finland is known as the land of a thousand lakes. That's a bit of an understatement because there are actually 188,000 lakes in the country uh, which were created as a result of rising sea levels uh, because the ice was melting and also because the ice carved into the rock as it melted. 188,000 lakes, by the way, that makes it one lake for every 29 fins. I wonder if they have a register <laughs> where they say, okay, also your lake is lake number 156,652 and Chris's yours is 167,101. I don't think they do, but I think they should. I think you should have a registered lake system where you and 28 other people all get assigned one of the lakes. It'd be a bit unfair though, because some of them are sort of like, you know, the size of small countries <laughs> and the other are sort of smaller than our bathroom. So. Yeah, it'd be a bit unfair if, if you just got a tiny puddle and you had to share it with 28 others uh, and then your friend got like the biggest lake in the country. Moving slightly away from the lakes, because Finland is so far up north on the face of the earth, the ice actually melted rather slowly here. It was still melting in the most northern parts when the first people showed up, which they did around 8,500 BCE. That's a fair bit later than Sweden, where we think the first people settled, at least in the very south of the country, around 10,000 BCE. Just like with Sweden, the predominant theory among historians and archaeologists is that Finland was settled from the south. Most of the very earliest remains of human life in Finland have been found in the southern parts of the country. There is evidence to suggest that there could have been some settlement from the north, or at least from the northwest, across the Atlantic coast Arctic regions. Especially the Laponian region and the area around the river Tornio is believed to have been maybe populated from that direction as well. Who the first people in Finland were and where they came from have been a topic of quite some interest because it might be already here at this very start of our story that we get the explanation to why Finnish sounds so different compared to Swedish, Norwegian and Danish, which can all trace their roots back to an ancient Norse language. Most likely, ancient Norse was never really spoken in Finland, and the first people who settled in Finland did not come from the same place as the first people who settled in the rest of Scandinavia. Whereas Denmark, Norway and Sweden were settled by North Germanic peoples, the first inhabitants in Finland instead had their roots more to the east, perhaps as far as in the Ural mountain region. Whilst most languages in Europe today can trace their roots back to an Indo-European common origin, Finnish, along with Hungarian and Estonian, is completely different. They are Finno-Ugric languages and can trace their roots back to the Urals, like we said, which geographically place their origin much further east. So, very simplified, we could say that while Sweden was predominantly settled in a more south to north straight line, people came to Finland in a more south east to north trajectory, slightly differently. And these people, they're here now, they're settled, and they are ready to hunt and gather and live a largely nomadic life for thousands of years. Eventually, just like everywhere else across Europe though, the people in Finland began to settle down and begin farming. 
although farming reached Finland relatively late. Because it's so far north, the Finnish land isn't really ideal for farming, hence why a hunter-gatherer type society remained for so long. In fact, after the people had settled down and began farming, they continued to combine that with extensive hunting, fishing and foraging. Exactly how much they did of each is nearly impossible to know, but most likely it depended on where in the country you lived. If you lived where the farmland was better, you did more farming, and if you lived on the coast, you did more fishing, and so on in quite a natural pattern. The early farming Finns also employed an interesting method to get more out of their less than ideal farmland. It's called slash and burn agriculture, which, I mean, sounds cool, but is actually a rather invasive farming method. What they did was that they cut down all the trees in an area, then set fire to the stalks and stubs in a controlled way, And once it had burned out, they planted in the ash. Uh, we talked about this in some of our very first episodes of the podcast. Because whilst this makes for quite fertile land, it also means that you constantly need to access new land to do this with, because you deplete the land very rapidly. And the trees. And the, <laughs> and the trees all burned down. In the end, the practice did die out because it was simply not sustainable. So the people in Finland were busy getting on with their lives. The ice was gone, they did some fishing, they slashed and burned the forest all around having pretty much a good time it seems like. Yeah, so it would seem. Uh, much like we saw in Sweden, a society that consisted of unity and collaboration in entities on a local level and with local rulers also developed in Finland. Chieftains and powerful noblemen ruled in a local area, and while some of them might occasionally join together and form alliances and act together to solve specific problems, there wasn't a unified large-scale system of rule that dominated the whole country as such. There also wasn't one group of people that identified as Finns, really, Uh, not that the concept of statehood and national identity was that strong anywhere in Scandinavia at this time, but in Finland there really wasn't a unified nation. If you rocked up in Finland in, say, 1078 and asked the first person you saw if they were Finnish or if you were in Finland, they would probably have no clue what you were talking about. A state entity didn't exist in that way, and neither did a national identity among the people, whereas this was more the case in Norway and Denmark, and getting there in Sweden as well. That's not to say that Finland was complete wilderness with barbaric savages running around with clubs in their hands. That's an equally wrong picture to paint. When we get to the High Middle Ages, we can see that by the time the three Scandinavian nations to the west had formed into three kingdoms, no united state had evolved among the disparate tribes of Finland. There were a number of these groups inhabiting various areas of Finland, including the Finns, the Tavastians, and the Karelians as just a few of the prominent ones. In these people's areas, there was some form of administration of justice, supervision of religious rights, and the means to unify their defenses against aggressors, aggressors who were becoming more religious in their aims too. There is evidence of up to 90 rocky, sloped-based fortresses from this time, reinforced with wood and or stone structures. These weren't permanently lived in or manned or patrolled by an army, but existed for the local population to retreat to if raiders or invaders arrived. There is one fortress, the fortress of Rapola, in the region of Tavastia that might have been a bit more permanent and inhabited year long round, but this is the exception rather than the rule. The local people would have warned each other with a series of signal fires to alert their neighbours to an incoming danger. I know Utikala and Kauko Piranan in their book A History of Finland say that this relatively weak system of political organization was a result of the sparseness of these settlements. Between each of the settlements there were vast stretches of wilderness. They had enough people to utilize the hunting grounds nearby, but not put up any sustained resistance against organized invasions or raids from their more numerous eastern and western neighbors. 
Finland also isn't mentioned that much when people talk about the Vikings and the Viking Age. That tends to be something that's more focused on Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. But that's not to say that people in the Finnish territories didn't get out and about. Just not to the extent that the other Nordic nations did with their Viking long journeys and raids and extensive trading. Finland simply had less people living there. The land wasn't as fertile, so you had to focus more on bare bones survival. Uh, and we also just have fewer sources when it comes to Finland in that period. So unfortunately, we know a little less. Still, the peoples in Finland didn't sit at home and knit while Danes and Norsemen were off raiding monasteries. They did raid, especially along the Baltic Sea, and they traded both eastwards and westwards. Uh, in particular, it was the Karelians, who lived in what today is the region split between Finland and Russia, who were a seafaring people and were recorded as raiding the shores of Sweden several times. For example, in 1187, they raided Sigtuna and killed the Swedish Archbishop Johannes. Yes, we read a little bit of a poem back in uh, one episode 33 or 32, uh, quite far back now in, in history. And um, we saw in our episodes about the Vikings in the East that Swedish Vikings who ventured to Kiev and beyond gradually settled there and became the Rus. This led to a split in relations between them and Sweden and eventually led to brutal wars over control of land and lucrative trade routes, especially with Novgorod. Modern-day Finland became a sort of middle ground between these two large spheres of influence in the east of the Baltic. We saw back in our discussion of wars with Novgorod that various groups of people from modern-day Finland got involved in one way or another with these conflicts. In 1142, the same year that Swedes attacked Novgorodian shipping in the Baltic, the Tavastians made a raid on the southern shore of Lake Ladoga, and the Karelians then raided Tavastia back on behalf of the Novgorodians. The Tavastians, whether they were officially aligned with Sweden or not, were at least enemies of Novgorod by this point. Okay, so we now know a little bit about what has been going on in Finland and who were the people living there. Uh, we hope you forgive our briefness when it comes to this background section, and we encourage you to go and look up more yourself if you want to learn more about the early history of modern-day Finland. So when did the Swedes rock up? Well, that's a question we can't really answer with a specific date. Or, or perhaps it's even the wrong question to ask, because the joint Swedish-Finnish history doesn't really have one starting point as such. There isn't one date, one battle, or one political decision that unites Sweden and Finland together. No, there isn't. Uh, actually, in his book, Svensk Hatet, The Swedish Hate in English, which... Uh, I thought it was quite a funny, interesting title. Anyway, in his book, Finnish journalist Jan Sederholm examines how the various interpretations of history affects Swedo-Finnish relations today. And he suggests that maybe we should ask the question the other way around and ask, when did the Finns come to Sweden? Because there is evidence to suggest that parts of the Swedish East Coast, especially north of Stockholm, did have some early settlement that came from the other side of the Baltic Sea, i.e. from modern-day Finland. This is a debated thing among historians, uh, but in a more general sense, it does seem highly unlikely that two bits of land that are so close to one another as the east coast of Sweden and the west coast of Finland is, would live in complete isolation from one another for centuries, especially when there is an extensive network of islands linking the two together. So the two sides of the Baltic Sea did have various levels of interaction, peaceful, violent, trade-related, and so on, over the centuries. The difference that we start to see now is instead the formalization of that connection, which in turn is a consequence of Sweden itself solidifying as a more united 
unified state under the rule of one king. Sweden, again like many countries in Europe at the time, had an expansionist mindset, or at least its rulers had. More land meant more people, which in turn meant more taxes, which in turn meant more money for you, bigger fortresses for you, and just in general more bling and prestige when compared to your other kings, who also were probably somehow related to you at some <laughs> yeah. point as well. More land and more people also protected you from your enemies and gave you more power in the world, or at least the European stage. We saw a lot of this all around the Baltic Sea in our last episode when the German traders expanded out to places like Riga and the north coast of Poland, following the nobles and the churches on these expeditions. If you read older Swedish history books or research by Swedish historians, you get a clear picture that Sweden and Finland were joined together through a series of three crusades, but nowadays that isn't really seen as entirely correct. First of all, the term crusade is problematic. A crusade is most often defined as a raid or military campaign that is ordered by God and sanctioned by the Pope, and that is instigated to fight enemies of the church. It is a sort of holy war, a military pilgrimage. And whilst these three military campaigns by Swedes in Finland were definitely partly religious and definitely involved the participation of the church, they weren't always seen as a military pilgrimage, nor was the Pope involved in sanctioning all of them. The three crusades that used to be mentioned as the three events that joined Finland with Sweden were won in 1155 under the leadership of our old friend King Eric IX, or Eric the Holy, and his mate, the English monk Henrik. This was when the Church of Orbo was founded, which is often seen as one of the first buildings that served as an outpost of Swedish influence on Finnish soil. The second crusade takes place in 1239. Uh, this one we talked about quite a bit in episode 38 because it was led by Bea Jarl. He wanted to expand Swedish influence and fight the Novgorodians, but they turned out to be too much even for him, and he had to settle for cementing Swedish influence in southern Finland instead. Bea Jarl's crusade it could be argued to be more of an official crusade because that one was in fact supported by the Pope. The third and final of these crusades hasn't happened yet in our timeline. It's in 1293 when the influential statesman Torgil Knutsson leads a campaign that takes aim at the eastern region Karelia, right on the border with Novgorod, uh, and settles some of that under Swedish control. During this campaign, the Swedes built V-Boy Castle to have a physical presence in the area. This became Sweden's easternmost base and eventually came to mark the country's eastern border until the 1700s. Um, some historians have argued that Swedish presence in Finland was in fact as much about having a bulwark against Novgorod as it was about having control over Finnish land. But yeah, more on this when we reach 1293 in our timeline, of course. Yes, looking forward to that. However, when considering that Vibor is today a Russian city with 80,000 inhabitants in the Leningrad Oblast or province, some 140 kilometers east of St. Petersburg, it does go to show how different Sweden looked a few hundred years ago. Once upon a time, the country stretched into what is most definitely modern day Russia, but also had no west coast at the same time, so it's very different. Yeah, it's, it's mind boggling when you think about it, really. Yeah, but like also said, it's an oversimplification to say that it was just these three crusades or campaigns that joined Sweden and Finland together. Rather, this was a gradual process that continued over more than a hundred year long period. As the Swedish state grew, developed and solidified in Sweden proper during the High Middle Ages, so did Sweden's influence and control in modern day Finland. 
The 1200s in general was a time of turmoil and struggle to gain control over areas around the Gulf of Finland. Novgorod had expanded from the east, and the Danes had tried to get a foothold in the northern Baltics and actually founded the town of Rival in 1219. Rival is today called Tallinn and is the capital of Estonia, so the Danes are taking over the north of Estonia at this time. Similarly, Sweden was involved in the general expansion at the time too. We've seen in our previous episodes how Sweden grew into a more proper state and kingdom during the past century, and also that meant that they had solidified control over more peripheral or border areas of the country, heading up north or even uh, east with Finland. But it's also to the south, where Sweden worked to formalise the control over Småland, the border region with Denmark, up in the north, though, this was so sparsely populated, state control would remain more loose for centuries to come, and there wasn't even that many people to rule over anyway. Importantly, there is definitely a religious aspect to this strengthening of the state's control over territories in Finland as well. Christianity was not new in Finland in the 1200s. There was a shift towards Christian burials in Finland already from the middle of the 1000s, uh, with a lot occurring in the 1150s too in areas such as Tavastia. However, this change does not necessarily mean the total conversion of the people to a fully Christian way of life, as pagan practices in some areas of life continued for much longer. The description of the conversion of the Finns to Christianity in historical sources does seem to be matched by the archaeology of these graves and other pieces of physical evidence that has been found. As we mentioned in previous episodes, Finland and Estonia are mentioned in a list of Swedish religious provinces written for the Pope back in 1120, so that's actually in Inge the Younger's reign. It seems more likely that rather than being under the control of the Swedish church, these were areas that were claimed or reserved for Swedish missionary work rather than documenting a conquest of that area by the Swedish state. Overall, expansion of church control and of state control did go hand in hand to a certain extent, much like we've seen it happen in Sweden proper. The church ruled over many aspects of civil law, and they helped spread the word of the state. So as one got more established in Finland, it helped pull the other one along too, so to say. There's also an additional layer when it comes to the religious aspect of Swedish control over Finland. After the Christian church split into the Catholic church in the west and the Orthodox church in the east in 1054, there had been a power struggle between the two groups. Obviously, one wanted to control more people and more land than the other. Since Sweden and the rest of Scandinavia was Catholic, their expansion eastwards into modern-day Finland also meant the spread of the Catholic Church eastwards too. And this was something that not just Sweden wanted, but that all of the pan-Catholic community in Western Europe wanted and supported too. To a certain extent, you can see the effects of this still today. Uh, whilst both Sweden, Finland and Russia are quite secular countries today, uh, Finland does still, to a certain extent, mark the border where the dominance of one church, although nowadays in the form of the Protestant church, ends and another one begins. Uh, east of Finland, the Orthodox church is the more dominant one, and Finland and, and Sweden and uh, many areas to the west are former Catholic countries, current Protestant countries. In the next couple of episodes, we'll see how Birya Jarl's sons take over ruling Sweden, and they will continue this strengthening and formalisation of Swedish rule in Finland. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much, though, since we will talk about it more in their respective episodes. But just as a teaser and as an example of the increased formalisation of Swedish rule in Finland, during the 1280s, one of Birya Jarl's sons, Bengt, becomes Duke of Finland. This means that there's a dedicated person within the state apparatus in Sweden that is set and put in charge of Finland. 
Historian Dick Harrison names this as one example of the way that Finland is becoming integrated into the Swedish state. We also see around this time how more areas of Finland are taxed, and taxed in a more formalized and dictated manner by the Swedish state. Actually, Orsa, do you know what many areas of Finland paid their taxes in? No. Rye and butter, of all things. Oh, my two favorite things, rye and butter, two necessary ingredients to make a tasty Swedish open-top rye bread sandwich. Yep. Uh, so they got that in tax from areas in Finland. Anyhow, to sum up slightly, Swedes didn't arrive in Finland and begin a formal colonization as such at one specific point. Yes, there were some important events, but overall, the integration of Finland into the Swedish kingdom was a gradual process that happened over a long period of time, and it happened as Sweden itself formalized and stabilized as a kingdom with a single strong ruler and more defined borders. Moreover, Swedish rule over Finland was also influenced by the expansion of Christianity and the divide between the Catholic and the Orthodox Church and their respective desire to rule as large an area in Europe as possible. And finally, Sweden's animosity towards Novgorod also had an impact on Finland, since the more land Sweden managed to control in Finland meant that Novgorod was kept away and kept from growing even more. Uh, but this, of course, also annoyed Novgorod. I mean, in a way, this is very much a foreshadowing of things to come. As we will see when we journey through Swedish history further, Sweden has often fought its powerful neighbours to the east, first in the form of Novgorod and then eventually their success of Russia in its various incarnations. And Finland has always been there too, right between the two warring factions and often bearing the brunt of the burden when the two states locked horns and of course fighting on behalf of Sweden as well. Oh yes, poor Finland, there is so much fighting and so much suffering yet to come. And what we wanted to do and what we hope we've done in this episode was to, from now on, incorporate Finland as part of Sweden. We wanted to give you a brief backstory in terms of what Finland was like previously and examine how it became part of the Swedish kingdom, or at least began to. So once again, from now on, whenever we talk about what happens in Swedish history, remember that this is also including modern day Finland. Yes, actually, when I was researching this episode, I came to think about quite an interesting example of what you just said. Uh, there's a Finnish military march, March of the Björneboyos, or Björneboyanas Mauch in Swedish. It's the honorary march of the Finnish defense forces, and it's played for the commander-in-chief, which is the Finnish president. Now, the first line in that march goes, and this is freely translated to English, Sons of a people that have bled, on the heath of Nava, the beaches of Poland, the fields of Leipzig, the hills of Lutzen. Uh, so those are all alluding to battles that the Finnish military have participated in, but they are battles that took place when Sweden and Finland was one country, largely during the era of the Swedish Empire, when the enemy and those fighting there saw the battle as being fought by Sweden, uh, but that's still the lyrics of the honorary march of the defense forces of the modern day independent country of Finland. Because we have that shared history, because those battles in Nava and in Lutzen in the 16 and 1700s were as much Finnish battles as they were Swedish. For example, Swedish armies included units formed in Finland and staffed by soldiers from Finland. For example, there was the Pori Brigade, a present-day Finnish military unit, but formed by Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus back on the 16th of February, 1626. 
still a military unit in Finland. Coming up to their 500 year anniversary and the vast majority of that time they were a Swedish military unit. So it was very interesting. Good on them. Shout out to the Pori Brigade. Yeah, indeed. Always. And we're very glad to have finally done this episode because as uh, you know, if you've been listening, we've been mentioning it uh, for a while now and it's been a long time coming. But we are glad to say that we've formally welcomed Finland into the narrative, so to say. And like we said at the start, it's important to stress that the joint Swedish-Finnish history is a topic of some contention, especially over in Finland. The study of it is also made more difficult to some extent because of a lack of early sources in Finnish, especially from this period. Um, but also because there was a move in the 1800s when nationalist ideals were sweeping across Europe that made the Finns re-evaluate Finnish history, or even rewrite some of it to some extent. And that led to sagas and epics like the Finnish epic Kalevala being written down. And just like with all the Viking and Norse sagas, there are amazing stories that contain some elements of historic fact in them, but they're also highly dramatized and fictionalized and so difficult to use as sources in a modern study of history. We should also say that we've talked about Finland and Sweden becoming one entity, but it would have perhaps been more accurate to talk about Finnish territories becoming part of the Swedish kingdom, because it mainly affected the more populated areas of southern and coastal Finland. Much like in Sweden proper, northern and inland Finland was still very much uncharted territory for the authorities, despite people still living there. Yes, because it was home to another group of people who we will come back to, and that is the Sami. Uh, the Sami population who live across modern-day Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Russia very much have their own unique history that we will have to cover as well. But for now, kito suomi. Uh, thank you, Finland. We hope you've enjoyed this episode about a modern day country that isn't Sweden, but that is an integral part of our history and that will be for many, many more episodes to come on our journey. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's now just time to say thank you for listening. We'll be back with an episode in two weeks' time. Until then, you can follow us on social media, at Flatpack History Sweden on Twitter and on Facebook, or you can email us on flatpackhistorysweden at gmail.com. And also don't forget to check out our new website, www.aflatpackhistoryofsweden.com, where you can find some of the sources we use, along with a map of Sweden in 1266, which includes Finland on it, and family trees for Birja Jars dynasty, and other things you might find useful as well. There's also, it's been on hiatus for quite a while and hasn't gotten that far yet in the story, but there is a History of Finland podcast too out there for you to listen to. We've definitely listened to uh, them up till now, so give them a listen too. Yeah, and, and do your own research on uh, the history of Finland. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful country, uh, but for now, it's bye-bye from us. Hey, Dor. Moi moi. That's goodbye in Finnish. Bye.